It is great to be with you guys this morning. So grab your Bibles, find John chapter 15. Uh, my name is Joe, Joe Harris, and I currently pastor Calvary 813. It's over in Tampa, right near downtown Tampa. And it's a bl blessing, honor to be here with you guys this morning. Um, I'm a guest, that's fine. You can clap, I guess. I don't know. I can't tell you not to, but we're clapping for the Lord, right? But um, so I've known Pastor Danny for a long time. I was on staff at the, the former ministry and uh, for many years. Um, in my early 20s, my life was in shambles and somebody invited me to church. And Pastor Danny was preaching and uh, I was radically saved. I was radically changed. Um, I began a little bit after that to work maintenance uh, on staff there for, for many years. Felt God calling me to ministry and Went to uh, Calvary Chapel Seminary, which means be a janitor, I guess, for a long time. <laughs> Prayed for a church, and uh, God, through uh, only a way he could do, he opened up a door for me to begin pastoring. It's been eight years I've been over there now, uh, serving at the church in Tampa. But uh, it's awesome. Great to be It's so great to see you guys. So many familiar faces. And just God is so surprisingly personal. I... I the scripture that we're in, John 15, is just, uh, it was such a part of that testimony. I will use several personal illustrations just because of how personal the scripture is, um, but we're going to get into it. Let's pray, and then we'll read the whole text, and then we'll come back uh, and go verse by verse. So, Lord God, we just pray that your spirit would be here, Lord. We desire a demonstration of the spirit's power, Lord, through your word. Uh, as we open it and as we receive it with open hearts, in Jesus' name, amen. So John 15, 1 through 8, I have the NIV here this morning, so read with me. I am the vine, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. You know, this scripture here is speaking of really the essence of what it means to walk with Christ, to be a disciple of Christ, right? It speaks to the, the meaning of life, showing yourselves to be disciples. If you're truly in the vine, if you're truly born again, you bear much fruit. You bear good fruit to the Father's glory. I love this scripture. It was one of my first scripture uh, memory verses, literally the, the Rocky Mountains of scripture. I mean, this is like the Alps, right? I mean, it's so glorious. And I just want to walk through each one of these verses, and then we'll look at five points at the end. But So look with me, verse 1 there again. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. So you don't want to miss the context of this. This is the upper room discourse, right? John 13, really through 17, is what they call the upper room discourse. Jesus is there, John 13, in this upper room. They're there to take the Last Supper, right? We want to orient our minds around this. Jesus has just washed the disciples' feet, even Judas's feet. I've always found that very surprising, right? That Jesus would wash even the one who would betray him, right? He washes their feet. He speaks John 14, these unbelievable words. Thomas asks, you know, how do we know the way? Jesus says the famous line, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. 
and he promises the Holy Spirit. And here in John 14, 15, he says, I am the true vine. But if you notice the very last verse of chapter 14, he says, come now, let us leave. So Jesus now, they seem to leave the upper room and they're walking towards the Garden of Gethsemane. This is Thursday night, right? This is this long conversation of Jesus with his disciples. Jesus is about to go to the cross. This is one of the most stressful times in Jesus's life. And he's taking it, he's spending it with his disciples. And he begins to illustrate the Christian life with a vineyard. That you are a vine, that he is the vine, that you are the branches. And he says, I am the true vine. This is actually the last of eight, I would call eight, I am statements. There's been, you know, what, what are some of them? I am the light of the world, right? I am the bread of life. I am the gate or I am the door. I'm the resurrection and the life. John gives, if you count I am that I am, there's eight I am statements. This is the last. Jesus here says, I am the true vine. The true vine. This vineyard is a symbol all through the Old Testament, Israel is always considered a vineyard. Many times, God calls Israel a vineyard. And there's a couple of places, a couple of scriptures I want to point out. Uh, you could write these down if you want. Uh, Isaiah, for example, Isaiah 5.2, I believe it's on the screen. It says this regarding Israel being a vineyard. He says, he dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines he built a watchtower in it. He cut out a wine press as a well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only what? Bad fruit. Here's another example. Jeremiah 2, 21. He says, uh, regarding Israel as a vineyard, he said, I had planted you like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. How then did you turn against me into a corrupt wild vine? Israel was always pictured as a vineyard or a vine. It was sort of a national symbol. It was engraved on the gates of the temple in gold of a vine. Jesus was probably walking and looking at a vineyard and saying this. And it was even on some of the coins uh, at the time. And what a thought, what a horrible thought it is that Jesus would be walking along maybe with you as a disciple or me. And that he would say or look at our lives and say, you've not produced much good fruit, useful fruit, right? You've produced bad fruit. Does that not frighten anyone? That frightens me. A sour, bad fruit, bitter fruit. I love grapes. I don't know about you guys. I, love, I mean, there's like, they're like candy to me, especially when you're trying to eat right I mean, grapes are like dessert, you know, some of these sweet grapes, moon draft grapes, the crunchy green ones, oh, they're so good. But how terrible it is when you get one that's just bitter, right? You want to spit it out. It's not useful for anything. It's not useful for making any kind of juice or eating, enjoying, nothing. God desires that his disciples be bearing good and much fruit, that, you, that your life bear much fruit to the glory of God. He goes on here talking about this illustration. He cuts off in verse two, every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Now he may have in mind here, Judas. I think he probably has in mind here, Judas that cuts off these branches that are not bearing fruit. Now, Judas you obviously probably know the story. Judas was a fake, right? He was a hypocrite. He definitely appeared to be a disciple. He looked like a, a Christian. He looked like a disciple. And I mean, even this, all of the 12 disciples, when Jesus said, one of you will betray me, they were all like, you know, nobody suspected Judas. They even were thinking, well, was it me? They know like the sin in their own hearts. Could it be me? Nobody suspected Judas. Judas had it all, had the appearance of a true disciple, but he certainly wasn't. And I think that's one of the things Jesus, Jesus has in mind here. But those who are true disciples, those who are truly born again, they bear much fruit and God prunes their life. God begins to do something in their life, change them from the inside out, 
changes us, cleanses, cleans, cleanses us. So fruit, right, is the evidence of salvation. You can judge a tree by its fruit. That's what Luke says in, in Luke chapter 6, right? Luke, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad true tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. Verse 3 goes on. You got your Bibles? We're walking through here. We're at Calvary. Come on. Verse 3. <laughs> you got it? You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to. Clean. That means sins forgiven. You've been clean. That's the, what the gospel does. It takes a sinner like me, like you, clean, cleanses us. We believe in Jesus, trust in Jesus as our Savior, right? That's the gospel, the good word, the good news that Jesus died on the cross, that he was buried, that he rose from the grave. And that's our only hope, right? That Jesus' life was enough, that his righteousness replaces our righteousness, that he is our substitute, that he took our place, that he's our substitutionary atonement. That is the word that cleanses us. You're already clean because of that word spoken to you. And then he says this challenge, remain in me, verse 4, as I also remain in you, no branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine or abide. So the New King James says, I love that word. ESV says it, abide in him, stay with him. You almost re must uh, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. You know, this is speaking to the life with Jesus. Salvation is so much more than just barely escaping the flames of hell, right? Like, I know I want it to be more. I want to be all in. Does anybody else want to be all in, right? I mean, we have eternal life. And John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life that you may know me, that you may know the Father. I mean, I want to be whatever it is I'm, I'm, I do. I want to be all in, whether it's fishing or I guess here I should say catching, right? It's fishing, parenting, whatever it is. That's why I don't play poker. I, I can't be all in, I'm all out, right? But with Jesus, I mean, like Bonhoeffer says, when, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. That means die to your old life. There is a new life with Christ, and it's a day by day, moment by moment, all in with Jesus. I in him, him in us abiding in the vine, letting God do what he wants to do in our lives as we abide with him, knowing him personally. I mean, he is so surprisingly personal. That is like the phrase for my weekend. Is, I mean, God is so surprisingly personal when we walk with him. So amazing. And then in verse five, oh, so good right here. This is, memorize this if you haven't. I am the vine you are the branches. If, and I love he, how he, he says if, right? He kind of puts that in our ball in our court. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. There's nothing that we can do in life that has any kind of value or significance Eternal value gives your life any kind of meaning if it is done without Jesus doing it through you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? So if you're a believer in Christ, well, your business deals on a Monday morning, right? If it is not the Lord leading your life and doing things through you, it's vanity. It's wood, hay, and stubble. That's the Bible. It will all be burned away. It has absolutely no eternal significance, meaning it doesn't glorify the Lord. Whatever it is, your performance at work, any speech you have to give, if we're not praying and allowing God to be the source of our wisdom, our intellect, our open doors, the places we go, it's in vain. It's useless, eternally useless. Any relationship with you have, why would you ever want to go back to making things happen in your own strength? <laughs> right? If God is closing a door, why would you want to force it open? I mean, if you are deceived, and I was deceived like that at one time where I thought following Jesus would be, I mean, I did grow up in a Christian home. I heard the gospel. I'm 18 years old. I, 
made the conscious choice thinking, I do not want to do God's will. Right? Like I remember a pastor saying that I was sitting there and I'm like, I'll end up being some missionary in Africa or something. I want nothing to do with God. Right. And I was deceived. And if you're here this morning and you think that life without Jesus is better in somehow, it's fake bait, right? It's like a plastic lure on a shiny hook that you don't see. And it's just going to pull you away into the broad road of destruction. It's not worth it to do anything in our own strength, our own intellect or wit. We need God. We need Jesus. Apart from him, we can do nothing. And he goes on in verse six, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. What is this fire? And what is he talking about right here? I mean, this is pretty serious. Sounds very serious. Really, there's three interpretations that you could take from this verse. And I just want to put them on the screen for us here. The first uh, interpretation, what is this fire? Is this hell? Is this what is going on here? Number one, it could be loss of salvation. Some people would say that. Some uh, scholars would interpret it this way or some people would. But when you take the context of, especially of the gospel of John, you think of John chapter 6, Verse 28, Jesus said, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. So it's not really a plausible interpretation that this is loss of salvation, that if, if we don't hang on, right? I certainly don't think it's that. A second interpretation of this verse would be that, um, that this person who's thrown into the fire of burn was a person like Judas who was simply professing Christianity was professing to be a believer, but actually didn't possess a, the spirit, right? Like he wasn't born again. had never come to the end of their sin. was uh, just maybe attending church, going through the motions, trying to be a good moral person, but was never actually born again. Had never repented of their sins, trusted Jesus as Savior. And we know very clearly that it, there are people like that. A crowd this size, there very well could be people here that are just going through the motions, right? That are not actually saved. Jesus said that in Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? Drive out demons in your name, perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That word for new is, is gnosko, right? It's to know Jesus personally as your savior, as your Lord, to know him like you know a friend, to know him as one who has forgiven your sins. And that, so John MacArthur would hold this view and he would say that the fire here is the fire of hell, that the person who's cut off is thrown into hell because they've never been redeemed. There's one other, a uh, third interpretation. Elmer Towns and his commentary edited by Ed Heinsohn would agree with this statement and this view and it's certainly plausible and it's the one I hold that this is a believer who is born again they've come to that saving faith but that's all it is that their whole life from that point is really wood hay and stubble that they do absolutely nothing to bear fruit right and that's what the bible speaks of that they there's just this fire is the fire of the bema seat judgment of christ if you're a Christian person here this morning, you will not face the great white throne judgment. What you will face is what is called, the Bible calls, the Bema seat judgment of Christ. You will stand before Jesus and he'll look and consider your life and he will, you will be judged according to how you've lived your life, your Christian service. And if what you've done has been good, eternal fruit, that is the gold, right? That is the thing that lasts for eternal life, that is rewarded. The fire is the fire of the judgment of that seed. And uh, for example, Jesus mentions this in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, not Jesus, Paul mentions this. 1 Corinthians 3. Let me read this to you. You can write it down. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day, that is the day, the judgment seat of Christ, the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. Notice 
And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, yet will be saved, even though only as one barely escaping the flames. We don't want to be that kind of believer that barely escapes the flames, right? We want to be all in. We want to abide with Christ, bear much fruit, not just a little, (laughs) much fruit to the glory of God. That's what this says. So what do we do with that information, right? We abide. We abide in him. Two more verses here. If you remain in me, verse 7, back in John. If you remain in me and my words, circle that, my words remain in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. What an amazing problem. I mean, this is like the essence of what it means to be a disciple right here in this scripture, right? You have the word and you have prayer. Abide in my word and ask. What a promise. And then in verse eight, this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. I love that progression. He's mentioned no fruit. He's mentioned fruit. He's mentioned more fruit. And he's also mentioned much fruit. So what is fruit? I'm glad you asked, right? (laughs) What is fruit? When we're saying fruit, like what is good fruit? Really, there's two parts to this. And really, there's You know, you could say, first of all, that good fruit is the character that God begins to work in you. You think of like the fruit of the spirit, right? Galatians chapter five, he lists there after the works of the flesh, he lists out the fruits of the spirit, right? There's nine of them, right? Can anybody name them? Can you name them? You should be able to name these. Love, right? It's agape love. God begins, this is fruit in you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So the fruit of God in your life is just that. He begins to change who you are. You're no longer the self-centered, arrogant jerk, you know, that you used to be. (laughs) I'm speaking to myself here, right? It's a process. Sometimes it takes time. Maybe you're a little bit less of a jerk today, (laughs) but God begins to change you. He begins to work love in your heart, joy, peace, these things. But he also, there's fruit, there's fruit of character, but also there's the fruit of impact, right? We begin to change and God from the inside out, he begins to do something in us and that just naturally begins to impact those around us. Whether it's us inviting someone to church or praying for someone or speaking the gospel or just serving them, serving in church. One place, turn with me over to Colossians. Colossians mentions that. This fruit of good works is many places in scripture uh, that it talks about it. Colossians is one of those places. I love this scripture. Colossians chapter one. You pick it up there in verse nine, speaking of this good fruit of impact. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. And notice this bearing fruit in what every good work, right? Growing in the knowledge of God. So there's this idea of fruit. It's in you and it's through you. There was a Christian man in the military who would kneel and pray Uh, Each evening, even though he was in the same room with other GIs or military men, one night he was doing this praying and after uh, several weeks of this going on, one of the soldiers in mockery throws a boot and hits this Christian soldier in the head. The soldier did not retaliate, but he continued to pray. The next morning, the man that had thrown the boot woke up to a pair of uh, his pair of boots freshly shined by the Christian man who had hit him in the head, uh, uh, who was hit in the head. And it wasn't long until afterwards, until that man came to saving faith, right? I love that illustration because it shows both of those things, right? The fruit in the person and the fruit through the person. It makes an impact. So I want to put some handles, a couple of handles, five on this text for us this morning related to a person who bears much fruit. So five things, if you want to take notes, 
a person who bears much fruit, number one, is a person who knows Jesus personally. Now, I actually want to turn over for just a second to Galatians, that, that section there on the fruit of the Spirit, and look at this list right before the fruit of the Spirit called the works of the flesh or the acts of the flesh. It says the acts of the flesh are obvious. Galatians chapter 5, picking up in verse 19, and I want to read this because... You know, if this is what, if this is the marks of your life, I mean, this is really evidence that maybe you have not come to know Jesus personally, right? There's no fruit until you turn away from these things. So just take an inventory. Like, does this describe everything about your life right now, right? Galatians 5 verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, that's porneia, right? Anything that has to do with sexual sin outside of marriage of a man and a woman, Impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft. That's pharmakia. That's definitely related to drug use. Witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, right? Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warned you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So when you take, when you, when you consider your life or Maybe ask the person closest to you. Okay, don't, don't do that. You know, is your life marked by this sort of cursing people out, lying to get what you want, right? Manipulating, maybe it's drug use. Maybe it's just uh, taking it, always flirting, trying to get with someone, you know, in, in that sense. If this, if this describes your life, you probably haven't, you know, first thing is that a, a person who knows Jesus personally, you probably have not come to the end of your sin. Jesus is saying, leave that life of sin. Right? The wages of sin is death. That means if you're still dead in your sins, you're on a path to hell. And he calls you to repent of your sins, to turn to Jesus, to begin this life, to be a new creation in Christ, cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And we'll give you that opportunity at the end of service just to surrender your whole life to Jesus. Don't put your head on the pillow tonight. Don't, don't leave this place without being made right with God through Jesus Christ. Be forgiven of your sins and begin that walk with Jesus. A second idea here related to a person who bears much fruit is a person who remains in the word of God person who remains in the word of God. If you remember verse seven, we read that in John 15 there, it said, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, All right? Ask whatever you wish. John 8, 31, if you abide in me or if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. You know, I can remember overcoming several addictions. One in particular that stands out to me is smoking cigarettes. You know, my whole identity changed. It was more like Joe Camel was before Christ. I would be smoking at least two packs a day, three if we were going drinking. And when we, you know, when I came to faith, it was like, that was probably the hardest, one of the hardest addictions, right? But I could just remember clinging to the word. I was so weak, so weak. I mean, I tried the patch for, you know, a day or two, but it's like, it gives you these horrible dreams and it's just like, but all I had, I remember just clinging to God's word and specifically this passage of scripture. And, you know, like Psalm 119, I just wanted to do God's word and hold on to his word. There's so much strength and nutrients, right, for the, for the, for the branch. That is the, you know, that's how you grow strong as a, as a branch in Christ, is if his word is in you, if you're abiding in his word. You know, so much... So many branches are malnourished right, because of uh, a really bad spiritual diet. You know, we're in the you know, days of TikTok and YouTube and Netflix. I mean, some people are just drinking in the polluted waters of a Netflix, Netflix binge, you know, like hour after hour, like YouTube. I mean, do you understand the stats of YouTube? You're never going to see it all. Like it is... I looked a few years ago, I mean, this is maybe three, four years ago, and 40 years of content is uploaded to YouTube 
every day. That was a few years ago. I really just looked at the statistics again in May of 2022. It's now up to over 82 years a day of content. We're never going to see it all, right? I'm not saying never watch YouTube, but I watch it sometimes to learn how to do, you know, whatever it is, right? But I mean, what are we drinking in? What are we taking in, right? Are we malnourished because we're not drinking? This is the waters. I mean, to be a healthy vine in the branch, to be a healthy branch in the vine, you know, there's nutrients, there's the sunlight, the presence of the Son of God in the waters that you drink in the good soil, Right? If you've ever tried to plant a garden or had, I mean, just any hedges really around your, your house here in Florida, you've probably seen those little grasshoppers, right? The, those things are a plague from Egypt, right? It's like they're black. They start off black like this big. You actually can kill them when you spray them about this big, but then they turn yellow, right? And then they're like, wow, that is a big grasshopper. And they're just, if you watch them, they are munching. I mean, they eat the leaves like big chunks. I mean, if you don't take care of these things, they will eat away at whatever it is you're trying to grow, right? Here's what I do to get, <laughs> to get rid of these things. What I just recently started doing. I was thinking about a, a gun, you know, like how do we get rid of these things? So what I decided is go into the garage, get a wiffle ball bat. And I had one sitting right on the hedge about the height of a tea, tea like tea ball, you know, except I'm going to pretend I'm on the raise, you know, sidewalk the home run and then just crank it out of the front yard, right over the, over the sidewalk. Listen, that's humane. That's more humane than seven dust or any kind of, it wouldn't even, that, that would be torture. That guy never knew what hit him, right? He was fine. Listen, some of us, and why am I saying that? It has a point. Some of us are allowing the grasshoppers, right, of depression, envy, hatred, to eat at their soul, right? To eat at our, bran our, our branch, and just right at the fruit, the thing that God wants to do, and you're just allowing these things. But listen, the word of God is what? I mean, Maybe he doesn't call it a wiffle ball bat, but it, the word of God is a hammer, right? The word of God is a fire. It'll burn away. It'll smack these things out of your life. Get this, you know, whatever's eating you and eating away at the good fruit, the things that God wants to do in your life. You have to get rid of those things. Let them go. Just whatever it takes, get them out of your life. The word of God will do that in you. Abide in his word. A person who bears much fruit, a person who knows Jesus personally, a person who remains in the word, number three, and these kind of, like I said, go together, some of them. Number three is a person who prays in the will of God. I checked in and was listening to y'all's uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting, and Danny was sharing many of these prayer scriptures, and so often we go right to the hand, right? We're, we pray these prayers, the, the gimme, gimme, gimme prayers, and I'm, I'm and there's a time to do that, right? James says, you have not because you ask not. And there's no shame in that. But if our lives are not in harmony with God's will, like a, you know, we're like a string out of tune on a guitar, right? We're not even going to know what note God wants to play. We want what is in heaven on earth. We want to pray prayers, big prayers, according to the will of God. But James also says there, you have not because you ask not. But he also says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So many big prayers. I mean, so many prayers that, you, that God wants to answer. I mean, God answers prayers according to his will. Don't, I mean, nothing is impossible with God, right? Don't be afraid to ask. I've asked for more baptisms, right? I've asked for a child, right? I've asked, I asked for a church. It's one of the things I heard uh, this guy, Elmer Towns, was listening to a lecture and I heard him say, I mean, he knew God had called him into ministry and he began to pray for a church. I started to do that. I wanted to, I was working as a maintenance guy. I knew God had called me to the ministry. I was preaching in prison ministry type thing, the bridge. And I began to pray for a church and it was a, 
a door that no human eye could ever see how it was going to happen, right? I mean, I'm a f- the foolish things of the world. Nobody was ever going to hire me, right? <laughs> that was my thought process. Begin to pray, and God opens doors that no man can ever see. You can pray that. Don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to pray. So number four is a person, a person who bears much fruit is a person who surrendered to the pruning work of God. Pruning means cleansing. Right? God uses clean vessels. And I'm not saying we're perfect. But we are called to do whatever it takes, right, to get the things out of our life that are, you know, polluted. Right? Jesus was very serious about sin. He even said, if your hand causes you to sin, what? Cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Let's hope you didn't mean that literally. Right? <laughs> That's... He's illustrating the seriousness of this. Cut, circumcise the, your heart. Cut these things out of your life because God uses pure vessels for noble purposes, right? That's what 2 Timothy says. Let me read this to you. You could write it down for the sake of time. Timothy, I mean, this is an awesome scripture. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy and useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions, pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with all who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So we should be surrendered to whatever God wants to do in us. Let go of the sin that so easily entangles, right? And walk with Jesus. Be useful, a vessel that he can use. Number five, a person who bears much fruit is a person who allows God to make things happen. You know, God is surprisingly personal, (laughs) This is not just some kind of religious routine that we go, to, go through, is it? I mean, we're not just good moral people, conservatives or whatever. We are walking with the living God, right? Jesus is alive. He is personal. He, is, he knows so much about you, right? Like his thoughts towards you outnumber the grains of sand on the earth, I mean, that's Psalm 139, and, and, you know, walking with God, we have to allow him to do what he wants to do. And it's so, I mean, you never know what he's doing. God can open doors that no one ever saw coming. When you, I just was over here worshiping, and I was reminded of Psalm 77. Psalm 77 in there, it says that your path led through the sea, right? A way that no one could ever, you know figure out what was God doing? You're taking me to this dead end place in my life, right? Why am I here right now? Because God wants to glorify himself, right? He wants to do something that no human can do. He wants to open doors that no man can open, right? He closes doors that, right? Never thought it would just be be something simple, but God closes the door. Are you allowing God to do what he wants to do in your life Wait on the Lord. Be strong. Wait on the Lord. That's Psalm 27. You know, and I'm not saying this to boast in any way, but I mean, I, I want only what God wants. You know, I've, I've never asked to preach anywhere. You know, I've allowed God to do that. I don't want, I've, since, since I've come to Christ, I just want, I will go work at the dump, right? Like if that's where Christ has me. Right? I want to do that. I don't want to do things that Christ doesn't want me to do. I know where that gets me. It leaves me bankrupt, addicted, right, on the path to destruction. I want to allow God to do whatever he wants to do. Wait on the Lord. Paul said the same thing. I came to you with fear and trembling. And when I came to you, I did not come with my own intellect, my eloquence, eloquence of speech, But I came to you with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith, so that their faith might not rest on man's wisdom, but on God's power. 
Like our faith is not in man, right? Our faith is in God and what God wants to do. God wants to do things in your life if you will allow him to do that in his timing and in his way. If you seek his face, he's so surprisingly personal. I understand there's seasons where you feel like, where is God? Stay the course, right? Abide, have these new, good nutrients in your life and allow him. He will show himself surprisingly personal. You know, John War was an 18th century, century shoemaker. He was abiding in Christ, hoping to make an impact. An apprentice was hired, talked to him about, and he began to just share Christ and talk to him about spiritual things. This new worker obviously didn't want to be bothered, but John Ward continued to share his faith. One day, this new apprentice uh, was caught exchanging, uh, caught stealing. Utterly humiliated, he goes to uh, John Ward, the shoemaker. He ends up uh, repenting of his sins, putting his faith in Jesus. And that shoemaker led William Carey to Christ. William Carey became a very fruitful missionary to India, right? And I love that story. I love the, the shoemaker, right? Working his profession, working his trade, abiding in Christ, bearing much fruit to the glory of God. You know, there's a pretty famous quote. I know you probably heard this. It's all usually accredited to D.L. Moody. It says, the world has yet to see what God has done can do with a man fully consecrated to him. And then he says, by God's help, I aim to be that man. You know, D.L. Moody uh, is usually accredited to that. But when you read the backstory of this, it's very interesting. Henry Varley was the revivalist that, that D.L. Moody uh, accredits to saying this. One time they were together doing a revival years later and D.L. Moody goes and asks them, hey, do you remember saying this? And Henry Varley says, I don't even remember saying that in those words even at all. And Moody says this, he says, ah, it was the living God. It was Christ speaking through you that said those words. You know, I love that because that's what it's all about. Christ speaking through you, Christ living through you, right? He calls us to surrender to whatever Christ wants to do. You know, Lindsay's going to come and we're going to sing, I surrender all this morning and you know, I just want to invite you to surrender to Christ. You know, whether this is your first time and this is your moment of salvation, don't harden your hearts, right? As you did in the rebellion, right? Surrender it all to Jesus. That's what God calls us to, to leave our sin behind, to lay down those things of our past, to trust Jesus as our Christ, to say, here I am. That's what Isaiah said here I am. He said, woe to me, I'm a sinful man. He understood his sin. He understood that sin was going to lead him to hell. But he surrendered his life. He said, here I am. Lord, use me. Take me. Take my life. You know, if, this is, if you've never done that, to give your life fully to Jesus, let today be that day. You turn away from your sin, that you begin a new life in Christ. You know, maybe you're here and you were saved 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Maybe you've wandered. You know, we all like sheep can wander away. Maybe you're addicted again. Maybe you're just about to fall off a cliff, right? You've been doing life by your own strength again. Come back to Jesus, right? Come back to the, the vine. Make a fresh commitment to live your life in the word, drinking in those nutrients of God's word and let him do what he wants to do. Maybe you're at a, that place, like it is, God has to show up, right? <laughs> like you're at the edge of the Red Sea. You're at the edge there. The door is closed. You don't know what he's doing. There's no sweeter worship than surrender. Surrender to him, even in that closed door. Don't force it. Don't, don't make it happen by manipulation or lying, right? Let him do what he wants to do. He will show up. He will be surprisingly personal. If you surrender to him, walk with him, abide in him, trust him, 